Good morning. In today's lecture, we shall discuss what happens when two waves are superposed. Suppose we have a room which has two light bulbs A and B and uh, we switch on only A or we switch on only B or if we switch on both of them. Now, we expect that when we switch, switch on both the light bulbs, the room will be twice as bright as the situation when we have switched on either A or B only. This is because we expect the intensities of the waves from A and B to add up when we have both these waves incident at the same place. But this is not always true. The reason why this is not always true is because waves can have both positive and negative value. For example, when we have a sound wave, the density fluctuation can be positive or negative. The density may go up or it may go below the average value. Now, if I have two waves being superposed and it so happens that one wave has a positive value while the other has a negative value at the same point, then if I add up these two, then there will be some cancellation and the resultant intensity will could actually be less than the individual intensities. So, the resultant in intensity when I have superposed two waves could be actually less than the situation when I have only the first wave or when I have only the second wave. This happens because the wave could have a positive or negative sign unlike the intensities. So, this phenomena is what is known as interference and we are going to in discuss the phenomena of interference which is a very interesting phenomena and it has lot of applications, it occurs in nature and it has a lot of applications. So, in the next few lectures, we are going to discuss this phenomena of interference and <clears throat> today we will take up a particular situation which is known as the Young's double slit experiment. So, in this experiment, we have a light source and the light from this source falls on a screen over here. The screen has a small aperture which and through which the light comes out. So, effectively this is acts like a point source, the, the, the aperture here is so small that you can think of it as a point source. Far away from this point source, there is another screen and the screen over here has two slits as you can see over here. So, there are two slits in the screen over here which is at quite a distance from this point source. And finally, we have a screen over here where we would like to study the intensity pattern as a consequence of the light which comes out through these two slits. So, you may say that we would like to study the image of these two slits on the screen over here. What does it look like? And the screen again is at a large distance from the two slits. Now, <clears throat> the point source is at a large distance from the slit. Now, the radiation, the wave that comes out from the point source is initially going to be spherical. So, when the wave comes out of the point source, it is initially going to be sp spherical But by the time it reaches the slit, 
the slits which are quite far away, you would expect the two waves. So, let me uh, draw a picture and explain this point to you. So, you have the point source over here and when the wave comes out it will be spherical, but by the time you are quite far away the radius of the sphere has become very large and for our purposes it is sufficiently close to a plane wave. So, by the time the wave from this point source arrives at the slit as the slit is quite far away from the point source the wave which arrives over here is a plane wave is well approximated by a plane wave. The point source over here is aligned with the center of these two slits. So, the plane wave that arrives over here on the slit is parallel to the two slits and this plane wave falls illuminates these two slits. So, let me <coughs> discuss this situation in a picture which looks like this. This is a section through the picture which I had shown you just a little while ago. It is the same situation just that we have taken a section through it. So, we have the point source over here and uh, the wave from the point source by the time it reaches uh, these two slits is a is to a great uh, to a great accuracy a plane wave. This plane wave illuminates these two slits and we are interested in the intensity of the light on the screen over here which is at a far large distance from the two slits. So, let us focus on a point P on the screen where we would like to calculate the intensity. The electric field of the wave the electric field of the wave at the point P will have two contributions. One contribution will be the part of the wave that arrives at P through slit 1 and another contribution will be the part of the wave that arrives at the point P through slit 2. I have not put names 1 and 2 to the any of the, to the individual slits. You can refer to any one of them as 1 and the other one as 2 it is your choice. So, if you wish to calculate the electric field of the wave at this point remember it is an electromagnetic wave. So, the quantity of interest is the electric field if you wish to calculate the electric field at the point P over here it will be it will have two contributions one that comes from the first slit E 1 and another that comes from the second slit E 2 and the resultant electric field over here at the point P is a superposition of these two contributions. And you should remember that the electric field both these electric fields E 1 and E 2 and the resultant electric field T all of them are oscillating with time because we have a wave. Another point which I should uh, clarify at this stage is that the electric field is a vector. And if the wave is propagating in a particular direction, the vector will have two independent components in the plane perpendicular to the direction which the wave is propagating. So, we should really be talking of the electric field vector because it has two possible independent directions in which it could be oscillating. The two polarization states which we have discussed in the uh, in uh, the few classes ago. Now, we are in this lecture in these lectures right now we are going to restrict our attention to only a particular direction of the electric field. So, we are going to restrict ourselves uh, to the electric field in only a single direction which simplifies matters because we can now think of the electric field as having only one component. We are, we are going to follow only one component of the electric field because we are going to look at the electric field only in one direction. So, if we restrict our attention to only one component of the electric field, one of the two possible components, then we can think of the electric field as a scalar. And in the rest of this discussion, we are going to we are going to do a scalar treatment. So, bear in mind that it 
the scalar treatment refers to only a single component of the electric field. There is, there is another component which will behave in exactly an identical, the identical fashion. Okay. So, <coughs> the electric field at the point P is the sum of the electric field contributions from the two slits. Now, <coughs> the two slits are illuminated by the same source, it is the same point source which illuminates the two slits. Further, the wave front is parallel to the slits. So, the electric field over here at the slit 1 and the electric field at slit 2 have the same phase because this is the definition of a wave front. All points on a same wave front have exactly the same phase. So, the electric field at all points on the wave front have the same phase, also the same amplitude. So, at the slit, at the location of the slit, so let us look at the two slits. At the location of the slits, the electric field is exactly identical. So, the electric field here and here are exactly identical. They are doing exactly identical oscillations with the same phase and they have the same amplitude. And both of these contribute to the electric field at the point P and it is these contributions that we call E1 and E2. And we have to add up these contributions to get the total at the point P. Now, <coughs> so let me, this shows you the same thing again at the point P, the resultant electric field is the sum of E1 and E2. And we have used the complex notation which is why we have these tildes on top. Now, the contribution from the slit 1 which is E 1 tilde T, this contribution we can write as E 1 tilde a constant amplitude, a constant complex amplitude into E to the power i omega T. Here omega is the angular frequency of the wave. And both these slits are illuminated by the same from the same source. So, the electric field at both slits are going to have the same frequency or the same angular frequency and the resultant which is the sum of both the contributions from both the slits is also going to have the same angular frequency or the same frequency. So, the point to note is that we have a factor of e to the power i omega t for the contribution from the slit 1. We also have the same factor e to the power i omega t for the contribution from slit 2 and the resultant also has the same factor of e to the power i omega t. So, we can cancel out the factors of factors of e to the power i omega t from all three of these and this expression now reduces to an relation to a relation between these constant complex amplitudes E 1 tilde, E 2 tilde and E tilde. E tilde is the complex amplitude of the resultant, E tilde is the sum of E 1 tilde which is the complex amplitude of the contribution from the first slit, E 2 tilde is the complex amplitude of the contribution from the second slit. And we have a complex number because we have to use complex numbers because the waves could have different phases. So, the contributions from the different slits could have different phases. So, we have to use a complex notation. The amplitude is a complex number. It has both the modulus tells you the real amplitude and the phase tells you the phase with respect to some arbitrary uh, oscillation. Now, these complex amplitudes are also called phasors. And these phasors, so for the next few minutes, we shall refer to these complex amplitudes as phasors. Phasors have a very nice graphical representation. So, let me spend a little time discussing the graphical representation of phasors. You might have already encountered phasors in uh, courses on electrical technology and su such courses, but I think it would be a good idea to just revise it uh, briefly over here. So, we have a complex number E 1 tilde 
So we have the complex number E1 tilde and uh, E1 tilde has a has an has an amplitude so we have the complex amplitude and it has a real amplitude which is the magnitude of the complex number E1 and we have a phase so we can write this as E1 e to the power i phi1 now we represent this complex number in a two dimensional plane so this shows you the two dimensional plane where we are going to represent this complex number called the phasor along the x axis so along the x axis this is the x axis i am going to plot the real part of the phasor so which is why i have written real over here and along the y axis i am going to plot the imaginary part of the phasor <coughs> Okay, so along the real axis, I'm going to plot the real part of this phase phasor, and along the imaginary axis, I'm going to plot the imaginary part of this of this phasor. So we are looking at the phasor E1, and in this two-dimensional plane, so E1 is going to be represented by a vector. The length of this vector is the the length of this vector e1 is the magnitude of the phasor so the length is the magnitude of the phasor whereas the angle the vector makes with the x axis phi is phi1 is the phase of the phasor so let me recapitulate again these complex amplitudes we refer to them as phasors these phasors can be represented in they are complex numbers so we can represent them in a two dimensional plane the x along the x axis we will plot the real part along the y axis we will plot the imaginary part so corresponding to every phasor we will have a vector in this two dimensional plane the length of the vector is the magnitude of the phasor the angle the vector makes with respect to the x axis is the phase of the phasor so this vector over here the vector over here shows the phasor e1 similarly a phasor e2 can also be plotted so we have plotted the phasor e2 so this is the phasor e2 it makes an angle phi2 with the x axis so you can see here it makes this angle phi2 with the x axis and it has a length which is the amplitude of the complex number e2 now <clears throat> in this situation in the situation in this in this particular situation we would like to add the two phases so the sum of the two phases is essentially the vector sum of these two vectors so the phasor e the phasor e is the sum the phasor e is the sum of these two phases e1 and e2 so and i can obtain this phasor e graphically by doing the vector sum of the vectors which represent the phasors which represent e1 and e2 so i can do a sum of these two phasors and this is the resultant phasor e <coughs> now so this e tells us the amplitude of the electric field at the point p now if you want to cal the quantity of interest here is not the amplitude of the oscillations of the electric field at the point p but the intensity of the wave at the point p let me spend a little time discussing this point for example sound waves we know cover the frequency range 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz so there are these 
oscillations in the density of the air at frequencies which span this whole range 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Our eardrum inside our ear we perceive these oscillations, but we do not what we record what our mind records is not these oscillations, but the average the time average intensity corresponding to these oscillations. Our mind we we our mind really does not work at that the the year the our mind does not work. So, the human being does not work at those high uh, speeds required to record the oscillations. What we record is the time averaged intensity of the oscillations. We I do not think uh, we have uh, uh, we have any I mean we have any sensation of fractions of a second which are so small right 20 kilohertz means a uh, few thousandths of a say a 10,000 20 thousandth of a second right that is the that is the that is how rapid the oscillations are taking place. And I do not think any of us have any real uh, feeling for a time that small the human being for example, works on the order of time scale of seconds. And what we record is the average the intensity of these oscillations. So, the mean square displacement of these oscillations something like that averaged over something like a second. So, we in the for sound we record the time averaged intensity for light let us talk about light the visible light the visible radi radiation we have discussed in the last class it oscillates at a frequency 10 to the power 14 hertz. So, it does one oscillation in 10 to the power minus 14 seconds and I do not uh, I mean I do not think any of us can uh, believe uh, can uh, speak about an experience on that time scale. So, we really cannot record uh, with our eyes we can we do not record the oscillations of the electric field what we record is the intensity of the electric field averaged over some finite time period which is of the order of in the range of seconds could be fractions of a second, but uh, not at the scale of 10 to the power minus 14. So, what we record is the time average of the intensity in most situations. So, it is this quantity which is of interest. So, let us now take up the question of how to calculate the intensity of the light. The intensity is the time average of the electric field. So, if I want to calculate the intensity at the point P, I have to take the electric field at the point P, this will be some thing which varies with time. I have to square it, take the time average, there will be constant factors outside which I have I am not really concerned with those. So, we have dropped those constant factors. So, up to constant factors the intensity is the time average of E square. And we can write this in complex notation. So, we have discussed this right in the first class. So, for an oscillating quantity, we can represent E t in the complex notation and we can write the time average of the energy of the intensity time average of E square as half E tilde into E tilde star. So, E tilde is the amplitude of the electric field in the complex notation and the time average intensity can be written as half E into E tilde into E tilde star complex conjugate of E tilde. So, <coughs> when you wish to calculate the intensity at the point P you have to take this phasor E and multiply it with its complex conjugate and put a factor of half. So, it is quite clear that the square of the length of this phasor the square of the length of this phasor is going to give us the intensity of the radiation right. E into E star tells us the square of the amplitude of this phasor. So, the square of the length of this phasor is going to tell us the intensity of the radiation at the point P. Now, when you want to calculate, so let us go back, let us now look at this picture where we have added the phasors E1 and E2 to obtain the phasor E. So, this is a vector sum of the two vectors in two dimension of the two vectors E 1 and E 2. So, the vector E is the sum of this vector E 1 plus E 2. To do a square, I, so to, to find the intensity I have to 
square this. So the square of this is going to be the square of the length of this vector plus the square of the length of this vector plus twice E1 dot E2, which is going to be E1, the magnitude of this into the magnitude of this E2 into cos phi, cos of the angle between these two vectors. And the angle between these two vectors, you can very easily convince yourself, is the difference between these two angles phi 1 minus phi 2, phi 2 minus phi 1. So, the length of this vector squared is going to be the length of this vector squared, the length of this vector squared into twice into the length of this, into the length of this, into the cosine of this difference in the, the angle between these two vectors. Oops. So, so this is what is the expression for the intensity. So, this tells us the intensity corresponding to a situation where we have superposed two waves. So, the discussion until now has been quite general. We have not referred to the Young's double slit experiment explicitly. We have considered a situation where we have superposed two waves and we calculated the resultant intensity. And what we see is that the resultant intensity, when I superpose two waves, the resultant intensity is the square of the amplitude of the first wave, which is the intensity. <coughs> there should be a factor of half throughout, which I have missed. So, you should. Uh, So, this is actually twice the intensity because we have a factor of uh, half over there. <coughs> so, the twice the intensity. So, the intensity to calculate the intensity okay, or what we could do is we could say that this is E square is equal to this. So, the length of this vector this phasor, the resultant phasor is the sum of the individual lengths of the two phasors plus sum of the square of the individual length. So, we are what we want to calculate is the square of this phase length of this phasor, the square of the length of this phasor is the square of the length of this phasor plus the square of the length of this phasor plus twice the length of this phasor into the length of this phasor into the cosine of the phase difference between the two waves. Okay. So, this is the most a very general expression which, will, which we shall use uh, quite often in our uh, discussion of interference. <coughs> Let us now repeat the whole exercise uh, uh, algebraically. We did, we did this exercise geometrically. Now, let us uh, repeat the whole exercise algebraically. So, let me do it over here for you. So, we have two waves. The first wave is represented by a complex amplitude E 1 tilde, which is E 1 e to the power i phi 1. And similarly, E 2 tilde is E 2 with a phase phi 2. Now, we would like to calculate <coughs> First, we calculate the resultant of these two waves, which is the resultant of these two complex amplitudes, which gives us. Okay, so we can write it straight away as E1 tilde plus E2 tilde. Let me also calculate the complex conjugate of this. Now, let us calculate the square of the length of let me cal of E of the resultant. So, let us calculate this. This is going to be a sum of different parts. The first part, so I am going to multiply this with this. So, the, there is going to be one part which I get when I multiply this E 1 
with e1 star which is going to give me e1 square and if I multiply e2 with e2 star I am going to get e2 square. Now I am going to multiply e1 with e2 star. So, I have e1 tilde e2 star plus e1 star e2 tilde and <coughs> let me now simplify this a little bit this we, we have to retain these two terms as they are. Now, we can write this into this using these two expressions of for E 1 and E 2 in terms of the real part of the real magnitude and the phase. So, this whole thing will become E 1 E 2 into E to the power i phi 1 this will give us e to the power i phi 1 this will give us e to the power minus i phi 2 because when I take a complex conjugate I will pick up a minus sign. So, I have e to the power i phi 1 minus phi 2 plus this term notice is just the complex conjugate of this. So, I will get the complex conjugate of this. So, let me write out <coughs> write down these. So, I will let me write down these two terms explicitly and then simplify the whole thing little bit. So, if I write down these two last two terms what I have is e 1 e 2 e to the power i phi 1 minus phi 2 plus e to the power minus i phi 1 minus phi 2. So, let me remind you again the first term comes from this the second term comes from this we are looking at only these two terms. So, the first term over here comes from this and the second term comes from this. So, that is what we have and this you can see is 2 e 1 e 2 cos phi 2 minus phi 1. Okay. So, we have obtained the square of this electric field of the resultant electric field and the square of the resultant electric field E square is E 1 square plus E 2 square plus 2 E 1 E 2 cos phi 2 minus phi 1. <coughs> and we could also write this in terms of the intensities. So, in, in terms of the intensities of the radiation we have to multiply this whole thing with a factor of half. So, half E 1 square is the intensity of the first wave, half E 2 square is the intensity of the second wave. E 1 E 1 is the so E 1 square by 2 is i 1. So, e 1 square by 2 is i 1. So, this is going to be 2 i 1 the root of this. So, e 1 is the root of root 2 i 1. So, using this I can write the total the intensity of the resultant wave as the intensity of the first wave this plus the intensity of the second wave if I express E 1 as root 2 I 1 and E 2 as root 2 I 2 then this becomes 2 root of I 1 I 2 cos phi 2 minus phi 1. So, what we see is what we have just done is we have calculated the most general expression of the resultant when I superpose two waves and uh, <coughs> let me now look at the intensity pattern which we get when we superpose two waves. Let me just uh, go through it again. So, when we have superposed two waves 
the resultant intensity i is the sum of the two intensities. So, the, the i 1 is the intensity of the first wave, i 2 is the intensity of the second wave. So, this is all that I would get if there was no interference. Now, interference arises because of the wave nature. So, we have this extra term which is the cause of interference. The extra term which we get is 2. Now, I have the square root of the product of the two intensities into cos of the phase difference between the two waves. Phi 2 minus phi 1 is the phase difference between the two waves. What is the maximum value that the intensity can have? So, the maximum value is occurs when the phase difference between the two waves is 0, when the two waves are exactly in the same phase or if the phase difference is a multiple of 2 pi that is the phase difference is an even multiple of pi then cosine of the phase difference becomes 1 and the this is the maximum value of the intensity that you can have it is i 1 plus i 2 plus 2 root i 1 i 2 and in the situation where the intensities of the two incident waves are the same you then have the the resultant intensity being four times the intensity of the individual waves just remember that if I had no interference and I had superposed two waves, I superposed two waves, I put on two bulbs, then I expect the intensity to go up twice. Because of interference, if the two waves are in phase, instead of going up two times, the intensity will actually go up four times if the two waves have the same amplitude. This is under the most favorable, cir favorable circumstances. Now, let us ask the question what is the minimum value that the intensity can have. The minimum value occurs when the two waves are exactly out of phase that is the phase difference is an odd multiple of pi. When the phase difference is an odd multiple of pi the cosine of the phase difference becomes minus 1. So, the minimum intensity i is i 1 plus i 2 minus 2 into the square root of i 1 into i 2. In the situation where the two waves which are incident have the same amplitude where they have the same amplitude the minimum possible intensity is 0 this, these two terms will exactly cancel out. So, in the situation where the two waves have the same amplitude the maximum is 4 times the amp intensity of the individual wave the minimum is 0 and in the situation where the two waves have different amplitudes you have to calculate the, the possible maximas and minimas and you can calculate the whole pattern over here. So, this is a very general formula which we are going to use in a large variety in a variety of situations where we have two waves which are being superposed and the situation where we have two waves being superposed is quite common. So, when we have the when we talk about interference we typically have two waves being in, uh, being superposed right. So, this expression that we have just derived is going to be applicable in all of these situations. Now, let us go back to the Young's doubles, double slit experiment that we were discussing. In the Young's double slit experiment, we have we were, look, we were looking at the intensity at the point P. At the point P, we have two waves which are incident, one from the first slit, the second from the second slit. The two waves from these two slits arrive at a with a phase difference. How much is the phase difference? between these two waves from the two slits at the point P. Now, the two waves have a phase difference because they have to travel different paths and for the point P located over here, the wave from the from this slit over here has to travel a larger distance and this is the extra distance which the wave has to travel. So, let me uh, mark this for you. So, this is the extra distance which the wave from the from the slit over here from the set from this particular slit has to travel and this extra distance you can easily calculate is d sin theta. So, this d sin theta gives us the extra distance that the wave from this particular slit has to travel as compared to the wave from this slit. This is the path difference. 
and if you want to cal convert this we want to convert this path difference to a phase difference so to do that you have to multiply it by a factor of 2 pi by lambda a path difference of lambda corresponds to a phase difference of 2 pi so you divide it by lambda and multiply by 2 pi that will tell you the phase difference between the wave coming from here and the wave coming from here so the phase difference between these two waves is 2 pi d sin theta by lambda so when you when we want to calculate the intensity pattern for the young's double slit experiment we have to substitute this phase difference into the expression for the intensity uh, which we have just calculated so so when we wish to calculate the phase the intensity pattern on the screen over there we have to plug in the phase difference which we just calculated so this is the phase difference which we just calculated we have to plug it in to the expression over here for the intensity and in the young's double slit experiment the two waves have the same amplitude so i1 is equal to i2 we will express this as i so the intensity pattern on the screen over here is given by the expression over here i the intensity over here is represented by i this is a function of theta and the functional dependence on theta is shown over here it is 2i where this i over here is the intensity of of the wave from one of these slits so the intensity on the screen over here when both slits are open is 2i 1 plus cos 2 pi d sin theta by lambda this cos this term inside here is the phase difference between the two waves and you can simplify this and write it as the cos square of 2 pi d sin theta by uh, lambda with a factor of 4i outside now <clears throat> quite often it is the small angle so it is the angles near this line near the line to the center of the two slits which are of interest so small angles which are of interest and why small angles are particularly of interest shall become clear when we have studied diffraction so restricting ourselves to small angles when theta is small you can replace sin theta by theta and the fringe pattern the the pattern the intensity pattern is now this given by the expression over here you have all that you have done is you have replaced sin theta by theta so what's the what does it look like so the intensity pattern as a function of theta looks like this you have these peaks in the intensity and you have places where the intensity becomes zero the peaks in the intensity are periodic let's ask the question what is the period of the peak in the intensity so the period of the peak in the intensity the value of theta after which the whole pattern repeats is lambda by d so if you look at the intensity as a function of theta the whole intensity pattern repeats with after a after an angle lambda by d radians and this is what it will look like so you will have these bands bright bands the bright bands correspond to the maxima of the intensity and then you will have these dark bands the dark bands correspond to the minima of the intensity where the intensity is zero and the whole thing is aligned in the same direction as the slits so the two slits are here so the fringe pattern is going to be in this direction so the intensity is going to vary in this direction if you look so in this picture the intensity is going to vary upwards so in this picture the intensity is going to vary in this direction and the intensity is going to be constant in this direction over here so you will what you will get is you will get lines over here which look like this the interference pattern is going to be lines which look like this and it is these lines which are shown over here and these lines will have a spacing lambda by d 
and these alternating patterns of dark and white bright lines is what is referred to as fringes so you will observe fringes on the screen over here so on the screen over here you will get a fringe pattern which refers to a pattern of alternating bright and dark lines with a spacing of lambda by d so we have just finished discussing the young's double slit experiment and the young's double slit apparatus and we found that it will produce a set of fringes the fringes are parallel to the direction of the slits now let me repeat the same calculation so let me repeat the same calculation in a different way so we will do a different analysis of the same calculation and the different analysis that we will do is quite interesting and it gives us insight and it is also useful when dealing with certain problems so the 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 situation so it is remember we are dealing with the same young's double slit experiment but the situation now is is we we discuss the situation in terms of different things so the situation here is that we have a screen so this picture shows you the screen and on this screen we have two waves which are incident on the screen both the waves originate from the same source but they are incident on the screen in different directions so we have one vec one wave with wave vector k1 so there is a wave with wave vector k1 k1 the wave vector k1 we can write as the wave number k into the direction n1 so n1 is a unit vector in the direction in which the wave is going which is shown over here we have another wave k2 which is also incident on the same screen k2 is in a different direction from k1 so the wave number corresponding to this wave is the same both the waves originate from the same source so they have the same wavelength and the same wave number so the wave number is are the same but the directions are different so the unit vectors n1 and n2 which tell us in which direction these two waves are going are different so in this case one wave is coming like this another wave is coming like this you can realize this in practice so you can realize this situation in practice by using one possible way of realizing it in practice there are many ways is by using something called a biprism so in a biprism you have two very thin prisms as shown over here on so these two thin prisms which are fixed like this this whole thing is illuminated by a plane wave and you can generate a plane wave by putting a point source very far away so you have a plane wave incident on these two prisms the upper prism bends the light downwards so the light which comes out is a wave traveling in this direction the light which comes out of here is a wave traveling in this direction both of these waves originated from the same source so they will be coherent they will have the same wavelength and you can do interference with them so we would like to analyze what happens on the screen over here now let us look at the screen and identify a point where both the waves come with the same phase so the point a is the is a point where both the waves have exactly the same phase so this shows you the same picture and we have identified a point on the screen which we refer to as a where both the waves k1 with wave vector k1 and k2 both of them have the same phase so the electric field of the wave of this of the first wave e1 and the electric field of the second wave e2 will be exactly identical and they can both be written as e e to the power i phi a where phi a is the phase 
of both the waves at the point A. I have already told you that we have chosen A so that the phases are the same. So they have the same value and we can write it like this. Now if the two waves arrive at the same phase at the point A, their oscillations are going to be exactly identical and when I superpose these two waves, they are going to add up and the point A is a point where I will have a maxima in the intensity. So the intensity is going to be maximum at the point A. Now let us consider the situation where we move away from this point where the intensity is maximum. We move away a distance, a displacement delta r. So we move to another point B which is at a displace, which is displaced by delta r from the point A. The question is by how much does the phase of the first wave change when I move from A to B. Now <clears throat> we have studied in the lecture on plane waves that the phase of a wave is omega t minus k dot r where k is the wave vector corresponding to the wave. And the question which we are asking in this particular situation is that at the same time how much does the phase of a wave change when I go from the point between the points A and B. So applying the definition of the phase we see that the phase changes by an amount minus k1 dot delta r. Please ignore the n over here it is a typographical error so it should not be there. So when I move from the point A to the point B the phase changes by an amount minus k1 dot delta r where delta r is the displacement between the points A and B. So we can say that the phase at the point B of the first wave phi 1 B is equal to phi A minus k1 dot delta r. Similarly, you could ask the question how much does the wave the, does the phase change for the second wave if I move from the point A to the point B. So it will be exactly the same as this the only difference will arise because the wave vector of the second wave is not k1 it is k2 these two waves being in different directions. So for the second wave for the same point B the phase is going to change by a different amount and the phase at the point B for the second wave is going to be phi a minus k2 dot r. So the point to note here is that at the point A both waves oscillate with the same phase. So we are going to have a maxima in the intensity. Now we move a displacement delta r away to a point B. At the point B the phase of the first wave has changed by some amount. The phase of the second wave has changed by a different amount because the wave vectors are different and the two waves are no longer going to oscillate at the same phase. So when I move away from this point which is a maxima the two waves arrive at a different phase and if the two waves arrive at a different phase you can see that the intensity is going to fall. So at the point A the two phases were different now when I have moved to a point B the two waves arrive arrive with a difference in phase so the intensity the cos the cosine term is going to be less than 1 and the intensity is going to fall. So you are going to have an intensity pattern on the screen. In the next lecture we will continue our discussion of what that intensity pattern is going to look like. So let me stop here for today and continue from here in the next lecture.